Hello, comrades, and welcome back to Shanka Show. Здравствуйте, дорогие товарищи. В эфире программа Шапка Ушанка. Today we're going to continue the topic of embezzlement of socialist property, and we'll talk some more about OBHSS. This topic I started in my video number 157, so we'll talk some more about department against embezzlement or misappropriation of socialist property. So OBHSS was pretty much the economic and financial crimes police, and they didn't bother much chasing Nisuni, workers that were carrying stuff out of their factories. That topic I covered in my video number 155, Peculiar Behaviors of the Soviet Workers. On a local level, OBHSS was famous for making unannounced inspections of retail stores in Russian retail store like Shapsko Magazine. Confuse me, for many years when I try to say store, I would say magazine or magazine and it's a completely different word, right? So they did a lot of it, they just show up unannounced to the retail store, lock it up and they start inspecting, checking uh, how much items they have for sale, how much cash they have, what were the sales, uh, trying to uh, check in their scales, see if they, uh, you know, cheating customers using scales, same as warehouses. So that's what OBHSS did a lot is harassing a retail part of uh, Soviet economy. And I'm saying harassing, like making sure they don't steal excessively. But generally, like big picture, OBHSS was after white collar crimes. And it's involved, you know, managers of the large retail stores, whole republics, factories, and also, they were after so-called tsikhaviki. I'm planning to make a separate video about it, but that's the people that organized underground factories, pretty much like small shops, where they are producing shoes, clothing, and such, which was totally illegal in Soviet Union. So there were a lot about uncovering those guys. And I have no doubt a lot of the cases were classified but there are some cases were actually made public in order, I guess, to intimidate and scare any other uh, criminals. So before we're going to talk about the most ill-famous criminal cases uncovered by OBHSS, we need to talk about the role of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union. I don't think you'll be surprised if I tell you that Soviet Union was quite a unique country. And one of the unique features of the Soviet Union was that its political system was monopolized by a single party. So Communist Party of the Soviet Union was the only political party in the country. So you can be bespartini, so you, like, you don't belong to any party, or you could be communist, you belong to the Communist Party. So there was no other alternatives. So picture, and maybe a lot of people will be happy if, for example, Democratic Party would be outlawed in Soviet Union. I mean, the Soviet Union, United States, they'll be called uh, enemies of the people. Sometimes Donald Trump drops that term, animals of the people or traitors, which is kind of scares me. You know, you ship everyone who said the Democrat to Alaska to cut down trees, and then you have just one party that uh, runs the political system in the country. And to be fair, a single party system it actually makes a lot of things much easier. It'll be easy to do elections, right? You got a single candidate from the single party, uh, so you save a lot of money. You don't need to do all the uh, advertising on TV, radio, internet. But of course, there's other problem. If any problems arise in the country, who are you going to blame? Since you're the single party, then you have to find somebody overseas or across the border to blame for your problems, right? But I don't see even, okay, this kind of case happens. We have just one party in America that, let's say, Republican Party will be pretty much like everywhere. You want to mean everywhere? The Communist Party of Soviet Union, and I'm trying to come up with the correct verb, it penetrated, permeated, I don't know what else to say, everywhere. Like, 
we're talking from the top level to the bottom it was like a two parallel structures of power so for example every factory would have a, a top communist person will be telling director like and watching him like how the things are going are you working and doing your quotas and keeping up with the five-year plan and he would respond to somebody who is in charge of the whole region and it goes up and up and up the chain of command all the way to the general secretary of communist party of soviet union and even to think about it like if you ask who was leader of the soviet union in 1980s and everyone would answer leonid brezhnev but he was general secretary of communist party technically I believe it was Gromyka, the last name. He was the actual leader of the Soviet Union because he was председатель президиума Верховного Совета СССР. I don't want to try and translate it, but he was technically, Gromyka was technically the leader of the Soviet Union, but that was pretty much technicality. The real leader was the General Secretary of Communist Party. That's how hardcore party was holding whole country in its grip. So why am I like a broken record, which is repeat party, communist party, communist leader, local communist leaders? I hope, I mean, there's a slight hope. I mean, I'm losing hope for the humankind, but there's a slight hope that people who don't understand why Soviet Union collapsed and they blame, for example, like Gorbachev, like he, there's some theories that he was a CIA agent introduced uh, to destroy Soviet Union maybe this video somewhat explains or opens eyes like what the main reason why Soviet Union collapsed the reality is because Communist Party penetrated the whole economy the whole life of the Soviet Union any large-scale economical crime wouldn't happen without local communist leaders knowing about it and participating in it this is the main kind of conclusion that i come up with and i think you will too the, because every factory had communist leaders every region had communist leaders overseeing leaders below and reporting to communists above anything large-scale economical crime wouldn't happen without local communist taking bribes and participating in it so the system was sick the system was full of corruption of cancer and as i mentioned we have the saying that selotka always uh, selotka always that the fish always start rotting from its head and it's an example how the whole big soviet fish was rotting and it was rotting from its head okay uh, now let's take a look at some most impressive famous cases that happened in the soviet union the earliest one i found was dated to 1969 so called azerbaijani case so this is 16 years after the death of stalin and you may say okay you see stalin died and now corruption blossomed in the soviet union maybe so first of all you know we had a communist party of the soviet union and then we had another 15 communist party of each republic so ukraine had the communist party of ukraine and azerbaijan had a communist party of azerbaijan so when the new leader came something wasn't looking right and it was discovered that in azerbaijan existed a price list for government positions think about it in the soviet union and socialist system there was price list for different government positions so, for example, judge, the price of that position was 30,000 rubles. And that's 1969 when average salary was 100 rubles. 30,000 rubles to become a judge. 50,000 rubles to become a local, uh, like a sh uh, sheriff. So we call militia, so police. So local uh, militia sheriff was 50,000 rubles. To become a secretary, Communist Party secretary of the local like area Raikom was 100,000 rubles. Huge money. Actual price list for the government positions. So let's pause for a second and think. 
why would anybody want to pay 50,000 rubles to become a local police sheriff? You know, it's not like, oh, I really want my son to be a, in a police force. It's because there was already a system in place of bribes, so you knew that if you get that position, people will be paying you bribes for whatever they're doing. So there was this giant corruption net, and if you want to pick some warm place, sweet place to collect cash, you have to pay up front, so you like invest in money to get a position where you can get a nice flow of bribes coming from people and businesses. Gastronom Yelisevsky case in Moscow, Soviet Russia. Its director, Yuri Sakalov, was running a large retail bribery operation going on from 1972 till 1982. Gastronom, it means grocery store, and that one was actually quite a historical uh, gastronome. It was open in 1901, so before the revolution. And Yuri Sakalov, its director, he tried very hard to have his store full of foods, food items. So he actually created a system of bribing. So he was paying bribes to get groceries to his store. And then he was getting paid... For the uh, by other directors from other grocery stores to get some items for themselves. So there was this whole system of circulating grocery items like deficitne, especially hard to get for, uh, foodstuffs, and there was a lot of bribes going back and forth. Okay, comrades, and now it's time to learn some Soviet era Russian retail terms, and the first one is. Targovlia is pod prilavka, or trading from below the countertop. Because of the shortage of quite a few food items, people at the grocery stores weren't interested to sell to any person some hard to get items, for example, like smoked sturgeon or some nice cuts of meats or whatever. So what they would do, they'll hide it items under the countertop. So if you look at the Soviet grocery stores, usually it's, you know, it's a table like a countertop has a scale. And then behind the, there'll be display of canned goods, teas, bread, whatever. And what would they do? They will hide under the countertop some deficit items. And then they will sell it to their friends or they will sell it for more money so for example if you want a, a kilogram of smoked fish and the price usually is 50 kopecks a kilo you might get it for three rubles a kilo if you know who has it and they will sell you ispod prilavka they will sell you from that hiding spot on the countertop that not everyone uh, not many people could see so that's a famous targovlia uh, ispod prilavka selling goods from below the countertop. So that means there'll be some deficit items sold only to specific people. Another popular Soviet retail term was Targovlia z Chornova Hoda, or selling from the back door. So the not the back door, but like emergency exit, I guess you can call it back door. So, of course, you know, every store had a front door where the customers come in, and there's the back door or emergency exit. That's the door where usually goods come in, workers come to work from the back door. Uh, so, trading from the uh, back door, in Russian it's called chorny hot, so it's like black door, if you translate uh, exactly word for word. So, you trade through the back door, uh, through the black door. So the director of uh, Gastronomy Elisevsky created this amazing system of uh, trading from the back door, Chornikhod, or Ispad Prilavka from under the countertop. And that was, you know, Soviet elite from Moscow. So there would be famous actors, singers, communist elite, all had to do. They, they just call, say, um, I would like to buy this and that. Uh, they'll get their order ready, they'll come through the back door or just come through the front door and they have a pa ready packages ready for them, here you go. 
and they'll pay some extra on the top of regular price. So this system worked greatly for 10 years. So when the scheme got uncovered, besides OBHSS, KGB got involved because there was a quite a few upper echelon communist apparatchiks and other leaders were blocking investigation. Uh, they arrested director of this gastronome, as I say, Yuri Sakalov. Around 750 other upper management people got arrested and other retail outlets who got involved in all this bribery scheme. Total was about 15,000 people involved in all the schemes. So we're talking about, you know, meat packing factories, fisheries, all the food places that make food because they were getting bribes to ship premium goods to this gastronome. Other stores were involved. So huge, huge scheme. And in the end, it didn't seem like Yuri Sakalo was worried much. He was uh, uh, telling him he's not guilty. He didn't want to sign any papers. And because he knew that everyone is involved, all the upper uh, Communist Party members were shopping at his store because they liked that everything was there available. It wasn't just like bare shelves like normal Soviet store. But Brezhnev passed away, Andropov came to power, and he was really in the mood to clean up the mess, to clean up all the Brezhnev people. And Yuri Sakalov was one of the victims of that cleanup. Uh, he got shot for his uh, criminal activity. Okay, I have a couple more interesting criminal cases to discuss, but this video is already getting um, way too long. I was told that the best format for YouTube videos around 10 minutes after that, viewers kind of lose attention. So we're going to stop right here and we're going to make another video about OBHSS and its most uh, impressive criminal cases that they uh, dealt with during the Soviet Union. So I hope you enjoyed this video and we'll talk to you soon. До свидания. Goodbye. Hey, by the way, the cool merch for cool comrades is available at the Ushanka store at the teespring.com. And if you love my channel and would like to show your support, please click on the link below this video and become the patron of the Ushanka show. For as little as one dollar, you can help us grow and create the new interesting videos about the life in Soviet Union.